So our next speaker is going to speak to you about preparing people who have mental illness as well as intellectual disability or cognitive disability for a successful transition to the NDIS. I'd like to introduce to you our next speaker, Mr Tony Stevenson, who is CEO of the Mental Illness Fellowship Queensland. As CEO and an executive on Mental Illness Fellowship Australia, Tony is passionate about reforms that improve mental health and wellbeing in Australia. His former roles have focused on a range of social inclusion and social justice priorities such as homelessness, child protection, child development and family support. Tony's been a strong advocate for reform, <coughs> contributing to many government and NGO forums, panels and committee. He's been a board director of QCOS and Families Australia. He was the principal consultant for the COAG's Reform of Children's Services in Australia, a subcommittee chair of the Australian Health and Community Services Ministerial Council and a director of the Queensland Government's Institutional Reform Secretariat. For over 30 years, Tony's been committed to a viable and proactive health and community services sector which works alongside families and individuals to inspire self-confidence and hope and enable people to build on their strengths for a positive and independent future. Tony lives in Brisbane. He enjoys long walks on the beach, spending time with his family and as a music enthusiast, please make him welcome. Please also welcome Michelle Moss who's coming from the... Queenslanders with Disability Network. She's also going to be speaking with Tony. Thank you. Um, as I trip up the stairs. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to present this afternoon around some work that we're doing in Queensland around participant readiness. Um, I'd also like to echo Rachel's um, sentiments to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. Um, my name's Michelle Moss and I'm the project manager of the Ready to Go project for Queenslanders with Disability Network. Um, so we, along with MIFQ, are one of nine organisations that have been funded by the Department of Communities, Child Safety and Disability Ser Services in Queensland as a way of helping Queensland prepare um, for the NDIS. We um, are in a unique position in Queensland given that we don't have a trial site. Um, so we've been able to, I guess, undertake a different approach in, in that readiness. Um, there's lots of readiness happening and it's a, a word that's being um, bandied around a lot, but this, this work is around helping people with disabilities and families and carers get ready for um, the implementation of the NDIS in Queensland. Um, we're on a timeline of um, that transition commencing in 2016, um, July 2016, and um, once we have our heads of agreement signed in December, um, we will hopefully know how that's going to happen and where that might, might start. Um, I guess the, the aims of participant readiness are about helping people raise awareness, their knowledge and their skills to be in the best position possible to be able to navigate that system and be truly in a place of control um, when they go into that planning conversation. Um, so just a bit about Queensland, Queenslanders with a Disability Network. It is an organisation of, by and with people with disabilities. Um, it operates a statewide network of, um, for people with disabilities and engages around systemic policy issues. Um, we also have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander network of people with disabilities and that's an important um, part of the work in terms of supporting um, that population in readiness for the NDIS. Um, so QDN's project is called Ready to Go and it's based upon a suite um, of opportunities for people to engage and, and learn. Um, we're working from a point of that introductory awareness of what is the NDIS and working through to build people's skills. Um, we've got a couple of things that we're calling master classes. Um, so it's about how to map for my future and doing that actual real concrete um, work with people about where am I now and where do I want to go? Um, what do I want my future to look like? What are those goals um, and aspirations that I have? Um, I think particularly for people with intellectual disabilities and as we've heard today, um, many of those 
um, people have a dual diagnosis, um, there, for many there hasn't been that opportunity to really think about a different future and to think about goals and aspirations and really what choice and control means. So um, we've developed the workshops to be really interactive and fun and to be um, something that gives people a real skill-based opportunity to, to learn. Um, we're also looking at ways of supporting people around a discovery challenge um, to actually go and have an experience in the community about different opportunities in their life domains. So that's a bit about our project. I'll hand over to Tony. Yeah, so MIFQ is also one of the nine organisations uh, that's a part of this project and um, it's just great that Michelle and I have the opportunity to work together on this but when you look at those nine organisations, um, Queensland Deaf Services, for example, um, organisations that have had a long history, in fact, have probably been at right at the forefront of the Unmet Needs campaign leading into the Every Australian Counts campaign. So organisations that have been the forefront of the leadership of uh, the NDIS for over a decade. So we've got the opportunity to really come together in Queensland. Um, MIFQ is a membership-based organisation. We've got a very strong emphasis on engaging with our members, uh, on recognising the lived experience of our, of our members and the history of our organisation and being very engaged with the communities that we work in. I think like many organisations here today, um, we, we formed out of the last big reform which was the closing down of institutions. And that's how, how our organisation came together. And it came together uh, through people uh, with that type of lived experience and their families and their carers to basically create something better, something completely different. And we, here we are doing the same again. It's worthwhile reminding ourselves of that. I don't think our uh, founders of our organisations really knew what they were getting themselves in for. What they knew was that the current system needed to be reformed. Um, there are only two organisations in that group of nine that specifically, I guess, uh, in a specialised way, work in the mental health area. That's MIFQ and Connections. And uh, I want to acknowledge my colleague, Troy Robinson here from Connections as well. Um, so this is a project of the Department of Communities, Child Safety and Disability Services. It's a department in Queensland that runs the disability services legislation and one bit of that is psychiatric disability. But really our voice is probably swamped in the mix of the whole of the disability system. Um, we have a reference group uh, for our work with Connections. Um, we have a consumer uh, perspective through Queensland Voice, a carer perspective through ARAFME, the sector represented through the Queensland Alliance for Mental Health and broader policy uh, perspective through Mental Health Australia. I might just go on to to talk briefly about um, what I think is a bit of a dilemma for us at the moment. Um, uh, we know um, what uh, experiences have been to date and of course we've, we've, we've really focused on that quite intensively over the last couple of days. So, you know, are we, um, now that we're taking this message out, our job is to get Queensland ready, this, that is participants ready. Not the sector ready, but participants ready for the NDIS. Um, so is it about um, you know being, being concerned about all of the issues that we've talked about over the last two days and being prepared to, you know, to, to think about what does this mean in terms of stigma? Um, you know, that there are some issues with language, there are issues with uh, how the scheme is being rolled out, or do we present a really positive message about what this means in terms of choice and control and, and you know, if you like, uh, download the information from the NDIA, NDIA website. I think, um, you know, it is a dilemma for us, but uh, really this is the opportunity for Queensland to tell its story now, and we are still 18 months away from the rollout. 
So the, the way in which we will approach it um, across those nine organisations, I think, is that this is now about cultural change and what the message has to be about is the big picture. The big picture about investing in people's lives now through an insurance model and the big picture of shifting from someone's going to do something for me to now I've got the uh, control over the direction of my own life. And what's important is how we actually go about um, participant readiness actually does set the scene for how people actually take up this approach of cultural change. People can now start talking and complaining to their existing service providers about having more choice and control and what they want from their current funding. And they can start actually shaping the market now. So I guess that's our, well, we've got this dilemma. That's the approach we're taking to, you know, to, to work to, to embed this notion of a cultural shift through our readiness program. Um, when, when I talk about being swamped by um, the mental health, uh, sorry, by the broader disability system, um, in Queensland, uh, yes, we have some, some funding through the Department of Communities. We have a lot through the Department of Health. Um, there's a lot of direct services, obviously, provided by the Department of Health. We have a central part of that department. We have autonomous health and hospital service boards as well. We've got DSS, obviously very uh, critical in terms of current funding and services. We've got federal health as well. Now, they're just the direct funders of or direct providers of mental health services. That doesn't include all of the other departments like housing and education and transport and police and prisons and everything else. Um, so, you know, that is one of the issues in readiness for us is that each of the agencies aren't ready with their message yet. We don't have a consistent message across all of the agencies in Queensland. Um, uh, so that, that's certainly one of our messages. And of course, um, you know, we all know that w within each of those areas of funding, what's tier two, what's tier three is the big question in everyone's minds. And of course, we don't know that either. But that's just the environment we're working in. We're aware of that. And we need to, to get that sort of leadership together across the agencies um, so that we've got the right sort of message. Okay. Actually, I could, did I have another slide? <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, um, if we think about some of the people um, that are uh, potential participants and current participants of services, uh, these are the people who we will be um, endeavouring to get the message out to. So it's probably only uh, Mario, in fact, who, who receives some support currently through the Department of Communities and they're running this project. Um, there are a lot of other people who are going to um, need to know about the NDIS. We've already talked today about people who live in boarding houses, hostels. Um, it's not going to be easy to get the message out to everyone and we need to have all of our partnerships and connections working really well to get the message out as far and as wide as we possibly can. But also for our partners in government to also understand where the people are currently located because it's not necessarily going to be in those places that have some existing funding. I think, um, Tony, leading on from that and some of the things that we have talked about over the last couple of days, uh, how do we actually engage with um, the broad range of, of people with disabilities and people with um, psychosocial disabilities um, in ways that are actually going to be meaningful for them? Um, I think one of the, the audiences that the department has asked um, QDN to work with are people in boarding houses and hostels um, and looking at how do we actually engage um, people 
in that conversation about the NDIS so that they can be in a place to have that information. And that's certainly some of the work that we have um, started doing. We're in the, the throes of delivering at the first round of our workshops um, this week. And the introductory workshop called Plan Ahead is um, a two-part two series so that people can come together and then come back the week later to build upon that that learning about what is the NDIS and what does it mean um, and how is it going to, going to affect me. And I think um, at the workshop we had on at, in Brisbane on Monday, um, we had five people come along from a 50-person um, boarding house um, that was the first time, you know, they talked about in terms of their, their learnings at the end of the day, it was the first time that they've even thought about having a choice and starting to think about what is it that I want in my life and what's going to be helpful for me. Um, I think so at that individual level, um, you know, we've got the, the nature of the work that, that's happening in participant readiness and I think the interfaces and some of the challenges that we're finding um, in Queensland so far have been um, around how do we then work with um, where people are connected to existing service providers um, to support and enable them um, to attend. I think particularly for probably for people with um, intellectual disability who are part of our target audience, there has been some gatekeeping that has occurred um, and you know I guess a reluctance or unwillingness to um, do more than say yep yeah, we've talked to people about it and they know it's on but yeah no one's really interested and I guess it's how do we um, ensure that we have access to, to people who are connected to the formal service system as well as not to get that message out that this is something important for people to learn about and understand and develop their, their baseline um, understanding about what it means. Um, I think the other important thing about um, the work that we're, we're doing and um, you know, jointly with MIFQ here today is about its peer-led um, and the importance of peers and we've, we've heard that through, through the last two days and certainly the plan ahead um, work is peer, peer facilitated so we've done work with a group of 10 people with disabilities including intellectual disabilities um, and they run the workshop. They facilitate two four-hour workshops in the plan ahead and they will be as we develop the master classes. Um, and I think that has the benefits of being a strong lever for change for the participants who come along to those workshops and we've certainly seen that um, in terms of the feedback that people have said, you know, that was great to have Donna delivering that and um, now I'm going to go back and talk to the people I know about what is what the NDIS is and certainly a very empowering um, process as well as the impact that it has on, on the people who are the peer facilitators. So we've just got a bit of a video around um, some of our peer facilitators who do have dual diagnosis um, for some of them and what the experience has been for them. Um, that Mickey can be um, a person that um, is not in charge, but a person that can help them if they need a hand up. Well, the best thing about being here to sit is the opportunity to have your voice heard and to get positive feedback from the people who you're talking to. And I have, I have the confidence to speak in front of a large group. Taking on a very good, mature role, helping people learn, um, you know, about the NIS and, you know, getting more professional development, um, you know, getting a new sort of experience in a form of employment. I got to meet with a lot of people that I had worked with over the years and, um, and met a lot of nice, really nice people. The team environment, the camaraderie that we developed as a team, seeing people grow, um, both our confidence as facilitators, as well as the people that actually were coming to the workshop. But actually being able to be part of the journey of watching them grow. 
was gratifying to see that finally they were being included and they were being addressed with their needs there. Speaking really clearly, so that so the, the audience and a lot of people can understand what I'm saying. Eye, eye contact as well, so that we, so I can keep my eyes on what I'm, what am I exactly doing, and also what I'm going to say. You know, being a coach facilitator with a, you know, with another person on your team, and you know, presenting well prepared information. Um, that's the ultimate. Um, so I guess just in um, some reflections and, and some of the challenges um, and learnings um, for the, the work as we move forward, um, I think for QDN we have a, a statewide focus so we will be um, delivering workshops and working with people across the, the state of Queensland which is always a, a geographical <laughs> um, challenge um, but also how do we ensure that um, we help people connect to those peer networks and I think um, the work of the disability support organisations as they um, begin occurring will be something that we can um, help people continue those connections of, of peers in, in a more um, formal way as well as what already exists. And I think Tony's already um, touched on the significant issue of the, the cultural shift. And I think the, the benefits um, that we're already seeing in terms of um, for, for individuals um, who are participants, but also the learning opportunities for support workers who come along and support people or family members at those workshops to start modelling um, that choice and control and to see that shift um, that is occurring because these workshops are very much delivered directly for the person um, and others are there as observers or supports as, as needed and that initial modelling has been quite profound in um, the learning um, of experiences of the, the support people who, who come along. Yeah, so while, um, yes, there are some, some concerns and some lots and lots of issues still to be resolved at a policy level and an implementation level with the NDIS, I guess we come back to the fact that people have the right to know even the most basic information to begin with and have the opportunity to think about that, to reflect on that, to, to use their networks and our, our local peer facilitated workshops will also encourage people to be able to, to come together and think about these issues together and continue to work on those issues and, and, and having that conversation being led by participants but also as we, we, we said, to, to bring together the staff, the services. There's so many people who will be in the audience for all of these messages, but it is about the cultural shift. So on the one hand, I think we've got the people who um, have been leading uh, the, um, the reforms for decades and if I can be a little bit cheesy and say that, um, you know, Queen's song is really, uh, it really sums it up. I want to break free. I want to break free from your lies. You're so self-satisfied. I don't need you. I've got to break free. And I think that sums up where people are coming from. Um, there's also, uh, you know, the, the great Gloria Gaynor classic. At first I was afraid, then I was petrified. There's a bit of that as well. But perhaps where we need to be thinking, singing in our head, is talk it over. Harsh words are spoken, promises are broken, old wounds are open. Let's talk it over. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michelle and Tony. We've got a couple of minutes for questions or song requests. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, just wondering if you could expand just a little bit on your engagement plan of engaging the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, particularly in rural remote areas, in their preparedness and readiness. Hmm. It's going to be a huge challenge just in that area, I know. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, two, of the, two of the nine agencies have um, particular responsibilities. Now, of course, it's not solely their responsibility, but um, while we've got, we've got nine, nine organisations, we've got the whole of Queensland, we've got all areas of potential participation in the NDIS. So the potential for us to be tripping over each other is just enormous. Um, so that's where we start looking at some of the themes um, some of the smaller local communities are not going to have nine organisations coming in. Um, so um, all of those issues are in the mix. And so with, with, um, with uh, more focused input uh, from the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, rural and remote uh, perspective, to help all organisations ensure that the messages are appropriate, but also that we've got the right um, media and uh, other ways of getting getting across to the communities. My question's a bit more on with Kevin's, just that I'm up in Cairns, um, you know, and as like you've said, Queensland's a huge state. What sort of representation will you have, like up further in far north Queensland? Or um, who can I contact? Um, I can give you the information of which agencies will be um, responsible for the work, but we'll, we'll certainly be going to, to Cairns to um, deliver a number of workshops next next year for, as QDN, and um, yeah, the, there's different things happening. Um, and I was just going to add around the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, um, it's recognised that there hasn't been any specific focus given to any particular, one particular um, organisation to, to do that engagement and work with those communities or the cult culturally and linguistically diverse communities. So some of the work that we've done is to, um, a number of organisations have pulled together to provide some funding to um, Amparo um, to to lead some of that work and QDN's um, produced some yarning circle videos as a beginning conversation that have been made by people with disabilities who are of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background to start beginning that, that work and then how we engage in conversations with communities. So, yeah, thank you. Last question here. Um, Wendy Kaplan from the ACT. Um, the work that you're doing sounds amazingly exciting. Um, and congratulations. Um, I'm just wondering it, um, some of the issues that we're facing in the ACT with one-off funding um, is around sustainability um, because we know that people are, are going to have to hear these me messages and test and, and really work through. So I'm just wondering what your plans are around that. Um, I guess we've got some, and I'll let Tony respond on to behalf of MythQ, but um, in terms of accept things online. Um, we know that that's not um, necessarily accessible for, for everybody, um, but we recognise that you know while this project ends in December 2015, and that's the end of this funding, that there's significantly more work that will be need to be done with people, and we will continue to um, raise that issue with our department and the NDIA in Queensland. Yeah. And I think and MIFQ will have a standalone um, website that will ensure that has sustainability and ongoing um, with um, regards to its resources and things that are developed. Thanks very much to Michelle and to Tony for giving us those perspectives from Queensland.